This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Go to skl.sh slash polyphonic9 to get two months of Skillshare for free. There are a few genres quite like metal. It's a style of music that's both beloved and hated, celebrated and criticized. Since its birth, it spawned dozens of subgenres and movements each more extreme than the last. And nowadays, metal is ubiquitous. It's a staple in many people's lives. But where did it all begin? It's a difficult question. No music exists in a vacuum. Instead, music growth is a slow-moving beast, building on years and decades of development. But was there a flashpoint? Is there a single artist, a single song you can look at as the branching point where rock split off and became something new, something wholly different, and something that would reach its tendrils into the modern world and become a genre unto itself? Let's take a closer look. On the broadest level, tracking change in genre is like tracking change in color. What is the exact point that red becomes orange? This is a topic that's highly debated in music communities, and to get to that transition point, we need to understand the early history of the genre. While many trace the origins of metal to the 1960s rock movement, the groundwork for it was laid a generation earlier. Like so much music, metal can trace its earliest roots to the blues. In the early 1950s Memphis blues scene, musicians began to play with heavier sound in their music. Artists like Joe Hill Lewis and Pat Hare played with heavier and heavier distortion, creating an angry sound out of their guitars. Check out James Cotton's Cotton Crop Blues for an idea of this sound. Well, like rain on the cotton crop just like a lucky man should die. Pat Hare even had a song called I'm Gonna Murder My Baby, foreshadowing the morbid subject matters that would become a staple of metal music. Yes, I'm gonna murder my baby. Don't do nothing but cheat and lie. This distortion then became essential to the surf rock movement coming out of America in the early 1960s. While surf rock may seem like an unlikely place for metal origins, it provided more use of distortion and notably riffs that used fast-picked guitar. Just check out Dick Dale's timeless Miserloo, which you'll probably recognize if you're a fan of Quentin Tarantino or the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> While these influences may have laid the early groundwork, metal really started to come about in the late 60s with some of the most famous rock bands of all time. These bands usually came out of England and were heavily influenced by the grit of American blues. A group like The Who played with faster tempos and heavier distortion. You can hear this in 1966's My Generation. Just because we get around. The Who were all about pushing their music to louder, heavier places, and a year after my generation, they released I Can See For Miles. One reviewer famously called I Can See For Miles the heaviest song he had ever heard. Legend has it, the Beatles' Paul McCartney read that review and took it as a challenge. And so the next year, the Beatles released Helter Skelter, a positively thunderous song. Helter Skelter! Helter Skelter! That song has a pummeling bass line, thick distortion, and harsh, shouted vocals. It's no surprise that a lot of people point to it as an early influencer of metal music. At the same time, Eric Clapton's trio Cream were trying their hand at heavier music. Listen to a song like Tales of Brave Ulysses for some wild, loud, psychedelic guitar soloing. But with all due respect to the Beatles, Cream, and The Who, none really hold the title of the heaviest song of the era. In 1967, the psychedelic blues band Blue Cheer recorded a cover of the Eddie Cochran tune Summertime Blues. That song has been covered a number of times, and The Who would even go on to cover it themselves. 
but none of these covers were anything like Blue Cheers. Sometimes I wonder what I'm gonna do. No, there ain't no kill for the summertime blues. Their take on that song was deep, dark, and loud. To this day, many people consider Summertime Blues the first real heavy metal song. I think one of the standout traits of Summertime Blues is how deep it is, sitting far lower in the audio spectrum than many of its peers. This is something that became a key part of metal, as evidenced by the genre's affinity for drop-tuned guitars and five or six string basses. Blue Cheer released that song in 1968, which became a really important year for metal music. Alongside Summertime Blues, that year saw the release of two more songs often called the first metal song. Steppenwolf's Born to be Wild came out in 1968, and it was a big hit following Summertime Blues onto the charts. That song uses gruff vocals, distorted guitar, and taps into motorcycle culture, an aesthetic that metal would draw from frequently over the next few decades. And perhaps most importantly, Born to be Wild featured the line, Heavy Metal Thunder. Heavy Metal Thunder! While Steppenwolf weren't using the phrase to describe music, it stuck, and people soon started applying it to the up-and-coming genre. And that genre found some more staples on June 14th, 1968, when Iron Butterfly released the 17-minute epic Inagata De Vida. That song was a psychedelic journey driven by heavy bass and thick guitar. Doug Engel's vocals on that song are absolutely iconic, giving an idea of what's to come in metal music. And the lyrics hint at walking fantastical lands, made more fantastical by the garbling of the intended title in the Garden of Eden. What might be more important than the songs released in 1968 is the new bands that were created. Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin. Though you don't often hear Zeppelin described as heavy metal today, they were one of the groups that brought the term into the public eye. Their debut album draws from electric blues but cranks up the volume and tempo. A song like Communication Breakdown is essential to the development of metal as a genre. Throughout their career, Zeppelin would also put together elaborate stage shows and sing about fantasy. But the fantasy Zeppelin sang about was often bright and triumphant. It was Black Sabbath who tapped into the darker side of fantastical imagery. Building on a trend set by groups like Coven and Black Widow, Black Sabbath started to use images of Satanism and witchcraft in their music. And then in 1970, Black Sabbath released their debut album. And while people may be able to point to earlier dates, there's no later date that you could reasonably argue for the birth of heavy metal. When Sabbath's self-titled debut hit the scene, it showed the world what metal was. Unlike some other artists who went heavy for individual songs, this was an entire album of metal, front to back. It featured Tony Iommi's thick tritone chords, made even darker by his false plastic fingertips that let him bend the strings like no other. Below this, Geezer Butler doubled Iommi's guitar riffs, giving them a darker, heavier sound. Listening to something like Wicked World, it's easy to hear that this is undoubtedly metal. <laughs> More than just birthing metal, this album also birthed one of metal's earliest subgenres, doom metal. Over the next few albums, Sabbath codified the genre of metal. 1970's Paranoid was loaded front to back with classic metal songs like War Pigs, Iron Man, Paranoid, and Fairies Wear Boots. Master of Reality laid the groundwork for stoner metal with Sweet Leaf. All right now. Alongside Sabbath and Zeppelin, there was one more group instrumental to the birth of metal in the late 60s and early 70s. Deep Purple. Their 1970 album, In Rock, featured Ian Gillian's screeching vocals, which would go on to influence other giants like Iron Maiden in the second wave of heavy metal. And throughout 
Throughout the rest of the 70s, groups like Judas Priest and Motorhead began to punch their way into the mainstream, helping tread new ground for metal and defining the genre. Thanks to these acts and many more, metal found its footing in the 1970s and exploded into popularity, growing into the many-headed giant you know and love or hate today. As metal developed into its own genre, it became clear that every good metal band needed a good logo. And the key to any good metal logo is a kick-ass typeface. If you want to learn to make your own kick-ass metal font, you should check out Design Your Own Fonts, from paper to screen, a Skillshare course by type designer Nathaniel Gamma. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in design, music, business, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high-quality courses on a myriad of skills. So that means once you've designed your band logo, you can teach yourself guitar with Henry Olsen's Beginner Guitar Masterclass, and soon enough you'll be ready to take the stage and start your own metal career. And best of all, if you sign up using the link in the description, you can get your first two months of Skillshare absolutely free. That means unlimited access to more than 20,000 classes. So go check it out and start learning today. And remember to use the link in the description to show them that I sent you and show your support for my channel. And if you do learn to design your own metal fonts, shoot them my way. I'd love to see what you guys can come up with. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. Just wanted to let you know that there's a sale on at DFTBA. So if you've been meaning to pick up Polyphonic merch, now is the time. You can get free shipping on orders over $50 between November 23rd and 26th. So go follow the link in the description and check that out if you want to pick up some cool posters and support the channel too.